Hello, everyone. As Jeff described earlier, we've come a long way since the days of Skip, or even Auto Skip. Think about managing the supply chain in the context of Amazon, a global company that operates in more than 80, 185 different countries across the globe. Our customers, perhaps many of you, don't know or even want to know how the right products ended up in the right place for them before they click the buy button. This means that our systems, our AI systems, are hard at work well in advance of any customer order. Our forecasting systems have to predict the appropriate amount of demand for each product that we sell worldwide. Our buying systems must determine how much product to purchase and from which suppliers. And our suppliers range from tiny mom and pops operating out of their garages to large manufacturers and brand owners. Our placement systems have to figure out where to put the product so it's as close to our customers as possible. And finally, we have to produce an accurate delivery promise, so our promise systems are also hard at work. Managing this complexity becomes increasingly more difficult when you think about the context of Amazon, when we have Prime, where we offer one-day delivery in some cases, or in the cities where we're operating Prime now, where that delivery promise is an hour or less. This is what makes AI an absolutely indispensable tool for us. All right, let's take a couple of product examples. It would be, my job would be relatively easy to forecast demand to produce a single day promise on products whose demand is very predictable. Or you can imagine linear. Take laundry soap, trash bags, crackers, the things that people buy all the time, household items. Or even highly season, even seasonal products, like wool socks in winter or sunscreen in summer. We know enough about those demand patterns to be able to put those products in the right warehouses close to customers to make that one-day promise. Unfortunately, forecasting is not that simple for all products. Consider some of the variables involved in whether we stock an item and where to have that product in inventory. We have to account for price elasticity. Take the case of TVs, a product that's highly sensitive to price variations. We also need to be able to differentiate between slow-moving products that some customers want sometimes and products that just won't sell at all. Take this pickle-flavored lip balm. Um, this may shock you all, but it is not a top seller. And we need to disaggregate, disaggregate the national demand to regional. We have to forecast for over 10,000 zip codes across up to a dozen different delivery options. Now we're going to talk about two of our hardest challenges that we face in forecasting. Those are predicting demand for new products and estimating demand for highly seasonal products like Halloween costumes. You never know which products are going to spike because of happenings in popular culture. Imagine if the latest season of Game of Thrones would have just launched before Halloween, the increased demand we would have seen for Game of Thrones costumes. This is actually why we started deploying AI and machine learning in our forecasting systems back in 2007. It was to tackle these two very difficult problems. The development of our first machine learning model, which was called Sparse Quantile Random Forest, or SQRF for short, represented a significant innovation for forecasting. We based it, as the name implies, on the popular random forest algorithm that enables decision trees. But we were able to make this algorithm scale to uh, billions of training examples. We were also able to handle sparse data with missing input values that allowed our forecasting systems to consume information from product descriptions and titles that had previously been inaccessible. The final thing is we were able to get a full probability distribution. We don't produce one forecast. We produce a distribution of outcomes. And SQRF enabled us to produce that distribution for any point in time along the year-long forecasting horizon. So SQRF was very useful in exploiting similarities with training samples using text-based data. But it wasn't able to borrow the statistical strength of other products across the time series. Therefore, we evolved our models. And we started to use deep learning, or, or neural networks. We began deploying deep learning networks in our forecasting in 2015. 
And since then, we've seen a step change in accuracy. The year we deployed deep learning, we saw a 15 times improvement than we'd ever seen in previous years. This forecasting accuracy translates to our customers in terms of higher availability of the products they want, faster shipping speeds, and ultimately, what we all want is lower costs. In 2016, we built a feed-forward neural network, or FNN model. With FNN, we were able to predict distributions for millions of products by outputting quantiles across multiple forecast start dates and planning periods for combinations up to a year ahead. Again, FNN was very successful, but it also had its limitations. FNN required months of manual training. In other words, for every new use case or every new country that we deployed, we actually had to spend months of our scientists' time developing the models, training the models, before we could put the new model into production to benefit our customers. So, as we do at Amazon, we evolved to newer and better models. Our current models, the newest models, are built around convolutional neural networks. They have automated feature engineering, which reduces the manual effort, and they access historical demand directly, which enables us to learn across products. For example, long history products, we can learn for new products and vice versa. A practical example of this is take digital cameras. They're constantly coming new to the market. When a new digital camera comes to market, we can use the demand history from the previous version to forecast for the new product. So this sounds great. We have models that learn on their own and, um, and produce accurate forecasts. However, these, while, we've, while we've been building these automated and fully trained models, our teams actually tripled in size because we need more smart scientists to build the next evolution of forecasting models. We're still hiring, by the way, so feel free to send me a resume. Our work here is far from done. We know that deep learning in its current state in our forecasting systems has several limitations that our previous systems didn't. The first and most obvious is these black box models are far less explainable than models that we had previously. This means that small changes in inputs can generate large changes in outputs that we can't fully explain. So to solve for this, we've invented some human levers. So humans can provide inputs to our forecasting models. Take an example of a, a new book. It's written by a celebrity or a well-known author. That author often goes to social media or talk shows to discuss and advertise for the book. Our models couldn't possibly know that there's a media blitz surrounding the new release that might drive demand. So this is where our, that humans can provide inputs to our models so that when this popular new book releases, it's available for our customers on the day of release. OK, so what's it all mean? My team forecasts for over 400 million products every single day for worldwide customers. It's clearly impossible for a person or even a team of people to create new, unique forecasts for each of these, these items. So for niche products, like this Nicolas Cage magic reversible sequin pillow cover, if we had to do forecasting manually, we probably wouldn't spend much time forecasting for, for Nick Cage. Um, but a neural network that's trained on the appropriate loss function can access thousands of other products that are similar to this one and produce a reasonable enough forecast so that we can be sure that if one of our customers in Las Vegas clicks by, there's a good chance we can have it on our doorstep within two days. So I think you can see that on the logistical challenges we take on on a daily basis, AI is an absolutely critical tool for us, and we couldn't do it without it. So now that I've explained the science behind forecasting, we'll show a short video to see how we use AI in our fulfillment centers. Most people look at an Amazon fulfillment center and imagine all the stuff inside. When I look at it, I see data. I'm Russell Algor, chief scientist with Amazon Worldwide Operations. There are one to four million bins per fulfillment center, 
and on the order of 10 million items. We have computer vision systems analyzing images to help us securely keep track of where everything is. Since our fulfillment centers are set up largely on a Manhattan-style grid, the paths that the pods can follow is relatively structured and organized. So the first decision I have to make is which orders I want to pick at the same time in order to get the items in the same box. And that's a large combinatorial optimization problem that I have to solve, and I'm solving in real time. Using that information, we try to minimize the distance the pods have to travel. We have decision engines and decision logic, AI optimization that's running to make those decisions in real time on a constant basis as the information underneath changes. We may build predictions of an action of how likely am I to need to access this pod in the next hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Once we put a label on the box, the transportation execution systems and processes all have to take over. So we'll use machine learning to build information about how long it takes to travel from point A to point B. To make the magic happen and get prime shipping in one day, we need to better use all of that information which machine learning and optimization at scale enables us to do.